Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to this eighth week Bonavero discussion group conversation uh, between Chris Stone and Johnny Steinberg. I'm Kate Regan, I'm the director of the Bonavero Institute of Human Rights here in Oxford, and I'm really delighted to be welcoming Chris and Johnny to engage with this provocative question, why do so many movements for police reform fail? Structural obstacles to democratic policing. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time introducing Chris and Johnny because most of you will know who they are and you'll have seen their publicity information. Um, but Chris is the Professor of uh, Public Integrity, Practice of Public Integrity here at the Blavatnik School. He's had a long career in civil service sector reform in relation to policing going back to his days at the Vera Institute in the 1990s and of course generally in the world of civil society activism. So we're really delighted for, to have him here talking on his reflections about uh, police sector reform. Johnny Steinberg is a South African author and scholar whose um, mode of scholarship is kind of deeply embedded scholarship, looking at the aspects of kind of life of ordinary people in South Africa. And one of the sectors in which he has written and deeply researched is in relation to policing in South Africa. He's also done work in relation to uh, prisons, so he's looked at the criminal justice sector more broadly uh, and um, a range of others. And his, his books, including Thin Blue Line and The Number, uh, are, uh, are must reads really for getting an understanding of South African society uh, from, a, from a different perspective to the one we normally get as members of an elite and scholars. So it's great to have you both here. Thanks so much for being willing to join us. Uh, it's in some ways it's at the end of a long term um, um, for all of us. And so uh, it's, uh, we're particularly delighted that you've been willing to come here today. The, the structure for those of you who've not attended a discussion group before is that Chris will present for about 25 minutes, followed by a response from Johnny for about 10, 10 to 15. And Chris may then have a rebuttal if he'd like. Uh, but in the meantime, we would really like to be gathering your comments and questions in the Q&A button. So if you look at the Q&A button at the foot of your screen, please add any uh, comments or questions that you have, and I'll moderate those to Chris and Johnny uh, once uh, towards the end of the discussion. Um, and I please encourage you to do that. So Chris, over to you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Kate. I'm just going to share my screen here. The uh, um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm really, really um, grateful for the chance to talk with you and everyone who's joined about this, um, and particularly with Johnny. Um, this is a topic, the, I feel like I've spent 40, 50 years of my, of my whole professional life trying to um, uh, do something about what it feels like and the experience of living in a heavily policed urban community almost anywhere in the world um, and the difficulties that that the way um, states police uh, police um, uh, uh, particularly urban communities uh, what the, the problems that that causes for people um, and um, and although I feel like a lot we <laughs> I've participated in a lot of things that felt very promising felt very energizing moments of great tragedy and difficulty but also of real what seemed like real breakthroughs and yet um, decade after decade it feels as if um, we just aren't succeeding and in many ways the problems of living in a heavily police urban community today are even worse than they were for um, uh, the people I knew growing up growing up in in northern Manhattan in in the 1960s um, and Particularly this year, over the last two years, there's been such a, um, uh, again, another sort of wave of energy, uh, uh, attention to need for police reform and, and energy in, in policing. And yet um, it feels in these last few months as if we're experiencing the deflation of those hopes um, and in many ways the frustration. And I, and I fear perhaps a incomplete understanding or analysis of why. So it's all, for all those reasons, it's a, it's a huge pleasure to be able to reflect with all of you um, today about what's going on. Um, why, um, uh, what is it about, about policing, pol particularly policing in democratic societies that makes these ambitions for police reform and efforts of police reform um, so um, unsuccessful? So let me let me just um, uh, I want to do three things um, in the in the next 20, 25 minutes. 
Um, I want to talk a little bit about what I mean by failure. That is what the what what my experience um, over these years has been um, in terms of uh, big efforts of police uh, police reform and um, and and what I mean by their failure. I then want to turn to some thoughts about the structure of policing in democratic societies. Um, how do we understand um, the institution of the police? Um, and why is it that it provides such uh, that that structure is so resistant to reform? And then finally, um, just some to open some thoughts on a way forward. How, how, if those obstacles are indeed the obstacles that we've been facing over these decades, what might we do to overcome them? Um, so that's the, the three parts um, I want to cover. Um, so let's start with uh, what I mean by failure. So um, there have been lots of different um, uh, movements for police reform over these decades. And I, let me just mention three of them um, uh, just at, by way of illustration. But many of you will have uh, will quickly think of other other examples um, of, of movements during this time. The movement for community policing is a useful one to start with because it remains a strong uh, reform impulse in many parts of the world. Um, and it's been around pretty much for the whole period that I'm focused on. Community policing, although um, there's no precise definition of it and different um, scholars and practitioners trace it back sometimes uh, decades or centuries, um, the, the contemporary movement for community policing dates probably from the um, uh, 1980s. Um, and uh, we see uh, police reformers both inside police organizations and um, in, in uh, community advocates um, concerned about policing and occasionally reform politicians embracing movements for community policing. In the United States, this starts um, in the 1980s. Um, with some experiments in New York City, in Chicago, and elsewhere. Um, uh, um, it reaches uh, um, in, the, in, the late 19, in, in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, David Dinkins runs for mayor of New York on a platform of community policing. In 1992, Bill Clinton runs for president um, on a platform of community policing and um, providing federal funds for 100,000 police officers uh, to do community policing. It spreads in London at the same time in South Africa, the 1991 um, National Peace um, Accords with the, the Ingata Freedom Party and the ANC and the government um, uh, endorses uh, 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 an idea about community policing, which then is built into the interim constitution in 1993. Um, and, and then um, into legislation in 1995, creating community policing forums around every police station in the country. Um, but there are similar efforts to build community policing as a reform strategy in Singapore, in India. Um, it's uh, in Japan, um, there are arguments that community policing is what they've been doing um, uh, for a century, but, uh, but it, it provides a new momentum. Um, so we have a, you have a, an effort, um, uh, a belief in you know, a wave of, of reforms um, known as community policing uh, all over the world. And, those, and essentially what, what um, they're after is greater public confidence, public partnership between um, ordinary citizens and police um, uh, in their communities. Uh, community isn't defined particularly well. Um, what that partnership looks like, who's leading it, who's following, um, uh, uh, is, is, uh, is, is all negotiated in different places. But the, the hope is to restore um, some, sometimes it's nostalgic, some level of trust, some earlier, um, perhaps fictional notion of good relations between police and community, um, uh, so that police can serve communities instead of oppress them. Um, instead of be a source of fear, they, be, they can be a source of confidence and a, a source of safety rather than apprehension. Um, that that uh, movement for community policing is often linked to um, a really separate move on of problem-oriented policing 
The scholar Herman Goldstein is often sort of uh, seen as a particular champion of it, but it also has um, versions around the world. Um, and this is more about a, a method for police to identify problems, to work on and solve them rather than simply respond to crime reports or calls for service or community complaints um, or directions from officials. Um, it spreads, it, it, it keeps getting discovered um, in, in, in the United States, issues, concerns about racial justice and equal justice, particularly um, for Black Americans, um, produced a, a sort of second wave of enthusiasm for community policing in the, um, in the, in the 2000s. Um, it's, uh, um, but, but no matter how many times we see these efforts, it seems to um, it seems to disappoint. Um, there was just a headline in the last few weeks in the UK uh, calling for a need to re return to the real ambition for community policing to try and um, assist the, to close the, the confidence gap that's widening between the public and the Metropolitan Police in, in London. So uh, a, 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 a vision for a, a kind of police service in service to the community um, very strong efforts, lots of money, lots of political weight behind it, um, and yet a sense of it um, uh, continuing to fail. I'd be interested. I don't. I don't think Johnny was gonna, wants to argue that it's succeeding in South Africa, um, but it'd be interesting to um, hear perspectives there. Um, the second, a second big move over the last decades has been a hope that somehow better data, better evidence, better better information about crime patterns, about where calls for service are, about better intelligence and evidence about the about crime problems that that uh, that uh, that are tearing at, at these societies could allow police to be more focused, more targeted, more accountable, um, more responsive, and focus on the on the real problems of crime instead of uh, making uh, making trouble for the citizens um, and. Uh, some of that was tied into new technologies, computer technologies allowing the geocoding of information, the um, easier compilation of data from emergency uh, telephone uh, services and other calls for service to police, but an effort to aggregate um, uh, data about crime, analyze it. Police departments all over the world started um, organizing meetings, sometimes weekly, sometimes monthly to analyze data together. Sometimes these were um, collaborative um, analytic sessions. Sometimes they were competitive analytic sessions. But whatever the particular flavor, the idea was to collect a lot more data about where crime is occurring, look at the patterns, hire crime analysts in every police organization, and use all this analytic power to target, better target police services so that it could be focused on serious crime problems and reduce crime um, instead of being wasted in random motorized patrol um, or um, just chasing whatever the most recent call for a, a minor, uh, minor annoyances might be. Um, and uh, uh, there, were, there were prizes given and budgets increased and people hired um, and yet the hope that somehow crime was on a permanent downward spiral, the crime levels in many parts of the world are officially recorded crime is much lower today than it was um, at whatever you pick as the, as the height, of, height of crime reports. Um, we, we are back into a cycle um, of rising violent crime in many of these same places where these tools were supposed to have been deployed most effectively. And so the, the hope that somehow we were, we were um, police were now permanently somehow able to um, reduce levels of violent crime or serious crime using these analytic tools, I think is as faded if, if, uh, if not gone completely. And finally, the, the, a, third, a third big reform strategy over these decades has been the development of new institutional arrangements for the oversight of police um, in democratic societies um, all over the world. The, um, uh, again, in the United States, in the UK, um, uh, but also in South Africa, in, um, across 
um, uh, across Asia, across many, um, uh, across many African states uh, that use um, different structures, um, some of them, um, uh, uh, there are, there are, uh, there are commissions in some in some states in Nigeria and and in Kenya. The Police Services Commission um, has some oversight functions. The South African Constitution create created in in 1990. Uh, the interim constitution and in, I guess just called for some structure. Um, the 95 Act and the 96 Constitution create the Independent Complaints Directorate, which has changed shape at least once or twice since then. Um, but you see in Brazil, you have the creation in the 90s of the Obedora, the ombudsman at the state level um, to receive complaints and investigate complaints against the police. Um, so in, in many different parts of the world, you see, you see over these decades, the creation of new independent mechanisms, sometimes tied to the judiciary, sometimes tied to the executive, um, a very occasionally tied to the legislature, um, providing um, uh, independent investigation. So the police aren't investigating themselves when there are complaints of corruption or violence or abuse, or constitutional or rights violations against citizens, but there's some sort of temporary or permanent structure um, designed to do that. One of the most promising that I encountered and got a chance to work with for a while was um, that created by the Good Friday Accords in Northern Ireland, um, the, the uh, police ombudsman for Northern Ireland, which in, in ways I don't think were all ever fully appreciated, became a, uh, actually a model um, for uh, the operation of these services um, globally, as well as even in the UK with the creation of the Independent Police Complaints um, Commission in, in, in uh, for England and Wales, which itself has taken on uh, changed shape a couple of times since then. A hope that independent oversight um, uh, would um, both boost confidence in the police, um, provide a level of accountability and, um, and, and help um, uh, end if, or at least reduce um, the complaints against the police in the sense of uh, the police overusing, overusing force or power or um, uh, in, in ways they shouldn't. Um, there are other examples, but those, th those are three huge um, worldwide trends, efforts of police reform, all of them embraced by governments, all of them embraced by advocates, by critics of police, um, and by reformers inside police organizations. And yet I think any survey of policing today would um, record all of those as having largely ended in disappointment or at least landed today in uh, uh, great disappointment, certainly compared to the um, utopian or idealistic uh, um, ambitions that informed the rhetoric around them and the investment in them. But I think even those who, who, just, who just count on, on gradual iterative improvement in these things um, I think the I think the the hopes the hopes for real reform here um, are are have been have been um, dashed, and I think part of the part of the reason that the slogan "defund the police" um, became so um, uh, controversial, but pop popular and controversial in, in the United States after the George Floyd's murder um, uh, almost two years ago, was was that the um, uh, was that these are uh, the the reform communities felt we've we've heard about reform we've been part of these efforts we've seen we've seen what what reform in these democratic societies has looked like when there have been big protests and scandals and deaths and patterns that were indefensible of policing and yet um, here we are again protesting again in the streets again, holding hearings, um, having um, independent inquiries created. Um, uh, surely, surely um, we're not going to simply repeat these, these patterns of reform. We've got to, we've got to do something else. And um, the slogan to defund the police is, can almost be seen as a, 
as a des as a desperation strategy um, that reform is just impossible. You can't. You this system somehow is impervious to reform. So um, uh, let me let me say a bit about um, why that is. There are lots of there are lots of um, opinion pieces around about about um, the failure of this or that in the last few years. But I wanna argue that there's something much more fundamental about policing um, in these societies that is resisting, has been resisting reform for decades, if not longer. Um, so let me take a very, let me go way back um, uh, to uh, uh, an explanation about how police, where the, the origin of modern policing, not in the UK, but in on the continent, this is a very simple adaptation of an argument developed by Michel Foucault in Discipline and Punish, um, in which he describes the origin of the French national police um, uh, in, in pre-revolutionary times um, as essentially a, a, a move by the executive, by the monarch, uh, uh, who, had, who had raised money by selling lots of offices around the country and had discovered that in having sold sold offices of magistrate and other others responsible for law enforcement in in across the country, they felt well they bought their offices so they didn't have to pay much attention to the king anymore. They could sort of exploit them for themselves. And the king needed needed his own his own um, sources of intelligence and understanding what was happening around the country and and created a created a police force that Foucault argues essentially um, engages, uh, is, 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 exists to feed information about what's happening across the country up to the executive um, and, is, and is designed to, designed to um, foil plots and um, uh, find, find, find people who might be um, uh, 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 trying to disturb the king's, the, the king's peace. And the way they do that is they, um, spread out into the community and they serve local citizens with their very minor complaints. Um, somebody's worried about, you know, what a neighbor is up to, a piece of minor disorder, a piece of annoyance. Um, and, and by helping, helping the, the citizens out with their minor problems, um, become, uh, gather information which they can then feed up um, to the kings. So they're using their powers granted by the king to help local citizens with their problems, not the king's problems, not the problems that they were created for, but basically engaging in a trade, trading information for service at the local community level, and then using that information to trade power for information with the executive. So essentially, it's not just that they're serving two masters, the community and the executive, it's that, in, that they're using what they gain with one to trade with the other. So it's, it's not just a, a public service with two customer bases. It's a public service that's gaining from the monarch the power that lets them serve the citizens and is gaining from the citizens what the monarch wants from them in exchange for their power. So it is a... It is a fascinating structure in which the police are, 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 are trading in both directions and, and gaining, gaining with both, gaining power both with the citizens and with the monarch, and in some sense gaining legitimacy in both directions as well. But Foucault goes, says, says the, the, the genius of this is that the police didn't stop there, that actually they made a similar deal with the judiciary and with the courts that by serving the courts, by bringing, by serving essentially as the gophers, as the, as the servants of the court, by bringing information, by bringing offenders, by serving, by serving papers, by, by, by becoming a service provider to the courts, they gained legitimacy in law. Um, that is, they become affiliated and associated with the courts and with law as a value and as a source of legitimacy in exchange for um, taking care of business for the courts. And so you have these, you have the police um, um, centuries ago 
essentially structurally operating in, in um, uh, the earliest democratic societies in the continent, um, figuring out how to use each of these sources of legitimacy. They have sources of legitimacy and they gain trust with the community. They have sources of legitimacy and gain trust with the executive. They gain, they, they, um, and they, they deliver service and gain source of legitimacy legitimacy from the judiciary and from the courts and from the law. And the, the police are balancing these three sources of power, these three sources of, of legitimate, uh, legitimacy and trust, and using the power they gain with one to serve the others. And it's that, it's that, it's the art of balancing those, those three things that becomes the art of leading a modern police service. We might today add a fourth um, structural er element um, that is the, the, the ways that police today are also serving corporate interests um, uh, in addition to community, executive, and judicial interests. Um, the, 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 most, the, most, um, uh, the easiest to illustrate of these corporate interests um, I'll pick up on would be from be in the US um, where uh, it's just easy to document. Um, uh, when I started in this business, there was one, I think there was only one police foundation in the US in New York, um, uh, but they got replicated. And there are these wonderful structures now, um, uh, these sort of, in some ways, anti-democratic structures around, um, uh, around the country in which different police organizations um, uh, participate in the, in the creation. Um, they don't actually run them, but they collaborate with these essentially nonprofit private foundations, which raise money from local employers, um, uh, millions and millions of dollars um, in the U.S. into each of these each of these foundations, which then provide off-budget purchasing power for the police agencies. Um, so in Houston, they've been buying weaponry. The New York one actually now puts on its website that it doesn't buy weapons because the use of these foundations to buy weapons for other police agencies became such a scandal. But they do buy canine um, dogs. They provide the funding for the New York police to send police to station police intelligence officers all over the world. Um, the New York Police Department may be one of the only municipal police departments with a whole large international division um, funded through these uh, corporate devices. And of course, this, like the other ones I've talked about, these are trades. Um, you're trading the money and the off-budget flexibility you get um, from these sources of revenue um, for service to the, your, your, these large employers who want to make sure that their interests, um, they have the different interests than the, than the King of France, they have different interests than the ordinary community residents. They want to make sure their employees are safe. They want to make sure crime in their, in their facilities is attended to. They want access at VIP level. Um, so there are a number of trades that the, these corporations are using. Now, those, those foundations and funding mechanisms may be um, uh, unique or at least unusual in the United States, but I'm fairly confident there are ways that large employers, large corporate actors, in many countries, find ways of supporting the police and making these same trades that their um, North American affiliates um, are able to do um, in the United States. So I think this structure um, is, it, is, is a useful frame to understand the problem of a police. The, the, if you, a lot of our reforms are just focused on one of these arrows. We're just trying to figure out how the police can deal with serious crime that comes to court. Most police activity never leads to anything in court. Most of it is, is not happening there, but, but our reforms are either focused on the police court arrow or they're focused on the police surveillance um, um, uh, role and information for the executive. They're focused um, as community policing was on the community, on the community arrow to connect connection with the police. Um, uh, and we often neglect the corporate one. The point is that reformers aren't focused on the whole picture. They tend to focus on one piece of this. 
whereas the police that they're trying to reform are managing all of this and more. We could, you could think, I'm sure you can think of other um, trades the police are making with the media, with legislatures, with um, other structures. I think these are, these are four of the most powerful, but it's not to say we couldn't in the discussion add to this, add to this list. But something really interesting happens inside a police organization that's making all these trades. They gain, the police gain legitimacy from each of these pieces. It's different in Russia than it is in, in the United States or in Canada or in the UK. But in some ways you can do, you can use this same analytic tool to understand where the police are gaining legitimacy, where they're losing trust and where reform initiatives are trying to shore up one of the trades, one of the relationships in this diagram. Um, but alongside of that, what at least I have found happening inside police organizations is the fact that they're trading with all of them makes them cynical with all of them as well. The police actually become cynical about what the executives want from them. They want political information. They want to win their next election. They want, they want to use that surveillance not um, just for good um, uh, democratic law enforcement, but they want to use it for personal, part partisan, often um, sometimes corrupt gain. The courts make the police sit around for hours as if they have nothing better to do. The courts want to treat the police, often treat the police badly as if they're just servants of the court. Um, and there's a tremendous attention um, and, and the lack of mutual respect um, between the courts and the police, even though they're dependent on each other for so much. The same thing happens with the community and police. So you end up, you end up with a police force that's drawing legitimacy from all of these and yet believing in the legitimacy of none of them. And you end up with a police culture that is really becomes about loyalty, loyalty to the institution itself, not to any of these. Its values and its alliance, the alliances they're making, they, they're operationally connected to each of these. Democratic theory says they draw legitimacy from, from, in some ways, from all of this. And yet the police become cynical about the exploitation. They're, they're being exploited by all of these forces. And, and become devoted essentially to, their, to themselves as an institution, an institution in its own right. And then the last piece of this, the last piece of the structural, so we have a structural argument here. We have an argument about cynicism growing in, in, within that structure. And then the last piece of that is that the reformers, most of the reformers don't wanna be police officers. It's a very funny field. If you want to reform medicine, a lot of people want to become doctors. If you want to reform corporate, if you want to reform corporate behavior, a lot of people decide they want to join corporations and become enlightened leaders. If you want to inform a lot of institutions in this world, if you want to reform education, you may want to become the commissioner of, a, of, of education or the minister of education. And it is striking, however, that people who want to reform police don't want to be police officers. And so in this field, more than in most, not, not uniquely, but more than in most, the reformers are trying to keep their distance from the very thing they're trying to reform. And you can't, you can't reform an institution entirely from outside that institution. Um, and yet building partnerships among those outside reformers with the inside reformers has been extraordinarily slow and difficult in policing. There is a, the reformers tend to, to vilify the, the very people they're trying to reform at the same time as they're trying to reform them. And um, on the inside, the reformers end up distrust, the, the reformers inside police have a very hard time making real partnerships with those on the outside. So um, that's the, those, are the, those are the elements a structure in which you're trading benefits with different power sources, you're distrusting all of your partners, you become devoted to your own institution, and the partnership between reformers on the outside and reformers on the inside, which is necessary for any reform to succeed, is particularly hard to generate in policing.
Um, uh, that's, that's really the picture I wanted to suggest. I'm looking forward to a discussion about how we can break it. But you won't be surprised to, to, that, that, that my instinct is that we need to look at the whole picture. We need to think about alliances across communities, courts, um, and even perhaps with business communities um, to check excesses of corrupt or um, uh, partisan executives. And you could follow a similar pattern in other directions. That is the reformers need to be playing with the whole picture. Um, we need to build partnerships between inside and outside reformers. And we wanna be, we wanna recognize that what we, what, what those of us outside policing have to offer is legitimacy something the police actually care about just as much as money and resources and all sorts of other things, that legitimacy and pride in the work is the coin of the realm. It is what we, what we as, as citizens um, and what those of us at institutions outside of policing can offer police in exchange for real reform. Let me end it there. Thanks very much, Chris. That was, was really interesting. And I'm now going to turn to Johnny to kind of respond to some of the thoughts you've raised. Johnny. Thanks, Kate. And um, thanks, Chris. That was fascinating. While you were talking, I was straining to listen for something I fundamentally disagree with so that we'd have a bone of contention to talk about. Um, but but I, I, I was largely just fascinated. I think that there may be, in the end, a couple of things to, to talk about. Um, so... I mean, my only close granular underground view of police reform was in South Africa. So I'm going to talk largely about that, but in a way which I hope makes some general points about police reform in general and, and what it is and why it has gone wrong. I mean, South Africa is in a way an excellent case study because at the end of apartheid, nobody was against police reform. It was the, in, in one sense, the perfect moment. Um, it was nobody could afford to be against police reform. This was an apartheid police. Everything was ostensibly up for grabs. Uh, first principles were up for grabs. This was, a, this was a time when police were, should have been as malleable as they possibly could be. Um, everybody was on the same page. And if you go through your, 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 your three types of police reform, all three of those were thrown at South Africa at the same time. You know, South Africa threw the kitchen sink at the police. There was, there was cop and pop, there was comp stat, there was independent oversight. It all happened at once in, in one big mush. Um, and, and within six years of democracy, it had all categorically failed. There's absolutely no question about it. Um, and, and why, I'm going to answer why first in the detailed empirics of the situation, but then in more generally what police reform is and, and perhaps why it fails everywhere. Um, so to begin with, I, I think the most important part of the context was the fact that the transition to democracy, despite being heralded as peaceful, was in fact very violent. And there was a great deal of disorder across the country in the early 1990s. And that is the, the country that the ANC inherited. Um, not just one of great disorder, but one where the question of whether a democratic regime could bring order was, was one of the big legitimacy questions facing it. Um, it. It had to hit the ground running. It had to show a theater of order immediately. It was very important to it. Um, and in that context, you had a structure within the police. I mean, you talk about ins insiders and, and reformers being outsiders. Structurally, the idea was to bring the reformers into the police. There were two director generals. The one was a, a uniformed police officer in charge of a force of, a, I forget what it was then, I think about 140,000 people. And the other was the director general of the civilian secretariat, which was a handful of, 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 of people, but they were both inside the organization and had equal power. So the idea was to bring reformers right inside into, into the top level of the workings of the organization. But what actually happened is you had a minister sitting there, Minister of Safety and Security. Uh, you know, to his left was the police commissioner, to his right was the civilian um, uh, director general of safety and security. And the point about being a politician is that stuff is happening and needs to be responded to. And you have a massive organization with huge firepower and a few civilians. So who is this? <laughs> who is the politician going to listen to? It is always the commissioner of police. And within a year or two, those reformers on the inside were incredibly marginal people. And I was talking to them at the time, they just got grumpier and grumpier. They, um, their formal power, though they had equal formal powers, in reality, they were boiled down to very little. 
um, precisely because of this imperative to bring order and, and who could bring it and who couldn't. And the reformers couldn't. They couldn't deliver what a politician really wanted in, in, in the run and thrust of, of, of the day-to-day -day world. So that was one reason. I mean, another is, it was really extraordinary the degree to which the police embraced the language of reform with, with such enormous alacrity. You know, I was piece, uh, speaking to senior police officers who couldn't wait to go abroad on study programs to, to the US, to Britain, to learn a new language, to learn a new discourse and to bring it home and to use it because that, that was the currency. It was the only currency and, and everybody was speaking that reform. And the speed and the, the ease and the, the fluidity with which old practices got clothed in new language was really extraordinary to see. I, I mean, I would remember going into townships where on a Friday evening, the police would gather in large numbers and throw themselves at the township, lock up every young man in sight on the grounds that he was drunk, fill the police cells, empty them when they were too full, and then go out again and fill them again, basically as things were done in apartheid, but all in a very sophisticated language of crime prevention, of problem-oriented policing, of hotspot policing, the whole thing. The, the extent to which the language of police reform was amenable to old practices was, was really interesting. Um, and I don't think it's coincidental. I don't think it's simply about the sophistication of, of police leaders. I think it's something about policing itself. And, and I will come to that um, uh, at the end. A third reason I think it failed, and, 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 and this goes to, to, to your point about Foucault. Um, when Thabo Mbeki came to office in 1999, it was quite clear that what he was really interested in, in what he was only interested in was information. Um, you know, he looked at the police service and the most important functions for him were the investigative and intelligence functions. And he needed to control them personally because he felt that if he didn't, somebody else would. Um, and so he brought in his man, Jackie Salebi, who was an absolute disaster for the police, but was not a disaster for Mbeki because he was in Mbeki's pockets. Um, and therefore the investigative and, and intelligence uh, services were Mbeki's. Um, and for him, that was fundamental. That is how he ran his organization and how he ran his government and, and nothing else mattered nearly as much. Um, so I was listening to your, your summary of the discipline and punish point and thinking, you know, that is South Africa to a T and no difference to, to South Africa under apartheid in a way where the investigative function was the, the elite upper tier um, uh, of the apartheid police service precisely for the same reasons, because those in power uh, required information more than anything else. Um, and so those are sort of three three points about the rapid failure of, of police reform. But there's a fourth, which I think is more difficult and more contentious and maybe more interesting. And that's that the old unreformed policing always had a high level of popular support. Um, and, and that was absolutely fundamental to its survival. And, and again, I remember, you know, these terrible apartheid dripping um, high density operations beginning in earnest in 1988, 1998-99, uh, and the crime researcher Ted Leggett going in their wake and doing civilian surveys and finding out what, what ordinary urban working class civilians thought of them, and, and finding the level of support for them astoundingly high, particularly among the middle aged, particularly among women. Um, and I think what that points to is a is a fundamental ambiguity or disquiet or, or dissonance, not just in what ordinary people think about police, but in what policing is. I, I think that people are afraid of police and angry of police and run to police. Um, uh, and that, that dissonance is at the heart of, of, of what policing is. I mean, I, I've always liked um, uh, Erwin Bittner's old uh, theory of policing, his old definition of policing, but it is, the police are the people you call when something is happening that shouldn't be happening and about which somebody ought to do something now. You know, policing emerges when there is a breach in order, when things are out of control, and when somebody has to come in who can exercise asymmetrical force over everybody else at the scene. I, I think that that remains the most powerful definition of policing um, that policing theory has come up with. Uh, the idea that policing is there in a moment that is uncontrolled, in a moment of disorder, which always inevitably arrives in urban life, it has to, that's the nature of urban life. And, and that's precisely where the constitutive dissonance comes in because 
it's precisely their their asymmetric force, um, or, or what Jean Paul Bourdieu in his book on policing called um, the unlawful lawfulness of the police, um, the capacity to come in without restraint, um, or with only nominal restraints, um, that gives security. But it's that precise nature of police that also gives insecurity. You know, the police is both the most fundamentally security giving arm of the state and also the most dangerous arm of the state and for exactly the same reasons. And, and that dissonance operates in people's heads. You know, the very people who, who answered Leggett's survey saying that they were happy with these high density operations also feared them. Um, and I mean, Bradier uses an interesting, he makes an interesting distinction. He says, his writing on police is not critique. Uh, critique assumes that you know the answers, that you have an alternative, that you have a solution. His, his theory of policing is he calls unquiet. And unquiet means that there's dissonance there that you can't ever dissolve, um, that you don't have a critique because you don't actually have a solution. Um, I, I found that profoundly important and interesting and brave. And it seems to me that reform initiatives perhaps should fail because they are critiques and they're not unquiet. Uh, because they believe that there's an alternative that might not actually exist. And the result is that they reinforce the problem unintentionally. And that's why I'm so interested in the fact that the senior South African police officers were able to take a discourse of, of reform and turn it into its opposites. I think that reform is easily turned into its opposites precisely because of the nature of policing, precisely because of this dissonance at the heart of policing. And I think that in societies where uh, the availability of guns is very high, like in the United States and like in South Africa, you can talk of abolition and you can talk of reform, but ultimately you will need an armed response to, uh, to that uh, bitterness situation where things are out of control. It, it really is ineradicable. And with that ineradicability comes the, the, the parallel ineradicability of the dissonance. Um, of the unquietness that Bradir talks about. So, and, and, and Chris, I think that, that your, your talk of hitting every problem at the same time and understanding the multi-dimensional nature of police, I think is fascinating. But, but I do wonder whether it isn't another iteration of form, uh, an, another iteration of, of not actually getting to the fact that that dissonance is there forever. Um, and, 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 and one needs to recognize it. And, and what does it mean to recognize it? Well, I think, you know, I think that defund has actually done us a huge service because it's thrown so many ideas into the pot. And, and, and one of the things that it's done is, is very, very crisply de-aggregated the various things that police do and shown how much can be done by other agencies. Um, and I think that matters a great deal. Um, but I think that there is one function, you can strip all other away, there is one function which will remain. And, and it, it, it will be an armed response to disorder um, in a society with high levels of violence and high levels of gun crime. I, I think that if you try to take that away, you will get Eric Adams as mayor of New York City, <laughs> or perhaps Donald Trump as president. Um, I think if you try and take that away, people feel fear um, and it turns into its opposite. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, want, I want to throw that out and say that, that critique can backfire of itself very, on itself very, very quickly um, and in such mercurial and unexpected and unpleasant ways um, if one tries to do too much. And that perhaps if one resigns oneself to the unquiet um, and to the fact that dissonance is there and always will be there, one can do much more. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Johnny. Those are really uh, perceptive and thoughtful remarks. And we've got some questions already, but I, I'm going to turn back to Chris to respond. But, but bef before I do, I just wanted to put to you something that I think has not come through uh, as fully uh, from your remarks or the things that I thought about in thinking about this in relation to Kailicha, which is the, is the kind of functional nature of the police, so less structural, more function in a violent society. And watching... Um, members of police day by day, how deeply terrifying their jobs are. Um, and actually one of their protections is actually one another. And this creates a sort of Irving Goffman-like total institution in which they, they survive by looking inwards and by protecting each other. But we are wrong if we, don't under, if we underestimate in a violent society how deeply frightened the police are on a daily basis. And therefore how getting them to do things. I mean, 
Johnny, in your book, you talk about, you know, the way in which a commander would send uh, people off on their night duty to the places that were quite difficult. And the first thing they would do is go somewhere else. Well, that seems absolutely natural response to me. And it may be one of the questions that's coming through is whether it's different policing in a violent society, but it's this, the function that police perform, they theoretically, of course, in fact, not in fact, have the monopoly over the use of legitimate force. They, they, um, they use a lot of illegitimate force and there, there are a range of other people who use force in societies, private sector, etc. But um, they're actually frightened a lot at the time in very violent societies and they're very much weaker than perhaps they're perceived by the community and therefore they turn inwards and therefore they're very resistant to changes that come from outside. So it's, it's the resistance of institutional culture which is partly driven by their function. Uh, and I just Chris, just some thoughts on that, and then we'll pick up some questions because there's some great questions coming through. Yeah, no, there are terrific questions in the in the in the chat as well. So just so very quickly, I think I, I, I mean, Johnny, I, 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 um, I again, I don't, I think like you, I don't disagree with it. anything anything you say. I do think I do think the um, the the point that there's a there's a feature of policing that I think is is worth just calling out, though I think it's implicit in a lot of what you said. It's 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 one of the services that doesn't that doesn't follow the usual rule, rules of customer satisfaction. That is the most frequent calls for service in um, uh, in in urban size, and this is true um, uh, both in London and in New York, for example. The most frequent calls for service come from the least satisfied customers, and it's. Usually you'd think if, you, if, if you're unsatisfied with the service, the traditional customer service model is you'll go somewhere else. But in fact, it's the very, because the police are the only um, ones available to, um, to those who can't afford private policing or haven't made the, um, the sort of other deals um, that can somehow escape, help them escape from the need for police services. Um, the, the calls for service that police get are from people who fundamentally um, would, you know, the day before would have said they don't trust or don't, um, uh, don't, don't like the police. And that changes the interaction, changes everything about that, about the dynamic there. Um, but it also means the police don't have to worry in the same way that other services do about um, uh, uh, about about that satisfaction. I have to worry about it for other reasons. You see that in London um, in the argument right now about stop and stop and search, where the the strongest voices that I hear about the need to restrict stop and search powers come from the Black Police Officers Association, who are who are worried about cooperation from Black communities in violent crime, including knife crime. And don't want to see it restricted there, but think that the the use of stop and search in drug cases, which is the vast majority of the stops in the U in in London and indeed across the UK, are eroding that trust. But but there, but it's the it's the desire for information trade off and legitimacy trade off that they're pointing to. And Kate, I think on your point, I agree with you about the fear. And anybody who's spent time, I think, with police on patrol or police in in in, in even potentially violent situations sort of sees that pattern. And it's true in military units, other, it, there, are, there are other places where you see that same um, uh, loyalty to each other and protection from each other being essential. But what's interesting is I think that turning inward happens even in societies that don't have that fear. So the UK, the Metropolitan Police also turns inward and it's not probably out of fear in the same Way. I think there's some really good questions in the chat um, or in the Q&A about, about, you know, is this different in a different kind of society in the UK or New Zealand or Australia where you don't have as much violence um, uh, the police are confronting. And I think what's so interesting about the failure of community policing or the failure of, of hotspot policing and other things is it is, or even the independent oversight reforms, is that these, these are common. So I think we need we need responses. We need understandings of what's of what's happening with the police. That that yes, police get scared in a violent society, but I'm not sure that's why or only reason why they turn inward. I think they turn inward elsewhere too. 
No, I'm sure that is absolutely right. Um, just turning into some of the questions. So the first one is about um, data-driven methods of policing in circumstances where the laws are proactively um, enforced, like in relation to drug prohibition. So basically what happens with the data drug is data is driven by what the police have done. Where do they decide to target people for drug prohibitions? And then that, you know, that creates a kind of vicious circle of um, the ways in which um, uh, the, uh, the laws are enforced. And, and that inevitably then will make people feel victimized because the police have chosen to do that. They go on doing it because the data has been driven by that. And, and that will undermine um, community policing. So that's the first one. I'm gonna pick up a few of them so that you can both respond to that. Um, a, a second and related one from the, uh, is the question of what, who is the community? And particularly in circumstances where there's deep conflict between communities, how, how, do, how do we think about the community when we talk about community policing, um, where there's conflicts about uh, values and interests, but there may be class conflicts, there may be uh, other conflicts. Um, and then I'm going to pick up a third one for this first round, which is whether it's helpful to think of a distinction between um, data-driven policing, the sort of hotspot tactics, identifying where there is um, crimes are happening regularly, which has been a tactic of the last several decades, uh, and a more evidence-based crime prevention um, uh, strategy, which is one of the kind of drivers of a defund movement, um, that, that there are multiple stakeholders involved in safety and that we should be able to divert from policing to other services, et cetera. So just three questions for you, for you each to think about. Can we start with you, Chris? Sure, I think all, all three of them are right. I mean, I agree with all those critiques. I think the, the I, I guess my, my point is that the, um, is that the critique, you know, it's the critique is um, uh, insufficient to produce the change. You know, it's, uh, I don't wanna spend the whole session on Foucault, but I love his observation that, you know, the critique of the prison, the solution is always better prisons, right? It's a, in the critique of community policing is, well, let's get the community right, or let's only focus on the right, on the real offenses. I think, I think the, the point here is to understand the police don't, don't the police use prohibition because it, it's a way of, it's, it's something they can do for the executive that's in charge that gains them um, other advantages. Um, not just the, the um, it doesn't gain them much actually to do with drugs. Um, the, the, it's understanding these trades that they're making across with law, with executive, with community, with, with other actors. I think that's, that's important to understand if you wanna change their behavior. So I agree with all, I mean, all these points are right. The, 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 the fundamental problem you could, but, but trying to get the community definition right isn't actually going to solve the problem of community policing because it's not, even if you get everything right, that's the, the deal the police want is information in exchange for um, service and what they're, and they're going to want legitimacy and support, but they're then going to use what they learn to satisfy these other, these, these other players. And that's the, it's the, it's the intersection of this. I, Johnny's suggestion that you know maybe we should break up the police and have other entities doing it, and in some ways I think if you if you gave the if you gave the Jackie Salebi <laughs> responsibility of gaining information for the president to a different agency, um, they would they would recreate it. They would it's 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 there it's there because um, you know for the same reason it, it showed up in the first place. That is the um, the the executive is going to want that information. I thought Johnny's description of South Africa at the at the end of apartheid was is a is a is a perfect illustration of that. So I guess so I agree with all those points. I guess my point is if we want if we really want to change police, we have to we have to be watching this whole map. We have to we have to be working on 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 the whole map and not imagine that we don't have. Um, uh, potential allies inside police organizations who would also like to like to um, see these things fixed if if we can attend to all of the all of the um, uh, demands that that they are trying to uh, 
balance. Uh, thanks, Chris. Johnny, anything you'd like to add to or respond to in those questions or to what Chris has said? Yeah, um, well, just a point about data-driven policing. Um, you know, in, in one sense, if used well, I think it would be extremely useful because one of the dangers of many elements of police reform is that they themselves inflate the idea that, that risk uh, of crime is ubiquitous, that it is absolutely everywhere. It's, it's a great irony of, of much of police reform is that it, it shares with what it's trying to replace an idea that we live in a very dangerous world um, and, and, and that, that dangers are ambient. Um, it's, it, it's one of the, the unfortunate collaterals of problem-oriented policing. You find, you know, you, you scan the urban environment looking for problems and you find them absolutely everywhere. And um, fear of crime increases because you're paying such attention to what causes it. I, I think a, a, a powerful theater of hotspot policing is to show that that isn't true. Uh, because one of the things that data generates is, is just how and evenly spread danger is, uh, how localizable it is. And so used for the right sort of theater and with the right sort of discourse, I think that data-driven policing can, can be calming um, and can actually take this constant inflation, this constant ubiquity of, of danger out of the picture. I mean, I absolutely agree that, that the problem of is, is where the data comes from and, 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 and the fact that it can be, who is dangerous can become a self-fulfilling prophecy depending on who's gathering the data and how. And of course, the question of how hotspots are policed is absolutely massively important. Um, and to de-escalate de in, in hotspots rather than escalate is, is, is important. But I, I think that shouldn't eclipse or shouldn't shroud the fact that, that gathering data can actually play a very powerful and constructive and important function. On, on, on hotspot versus evidence-based crime prevention, I, I think it's enormously dangerous to believe that, that, that evidence-based crime prevention can ever eclipse response policing, um, can ever eclipse order policing. They're just different categories of things. Um, and, you know, when you try and replace something that is, isn't irreplaceable, it comes back in forms that you're not expecting. Um, and so I think that making that conceptual distinction is is crucial. And understanding that a, a fuzzy, almost extra legal function of, of, of maintaining order here and now when something is wrong is not the same as crime prevention and can't ever go away. And, and once one understands that, one can start thinking it through and, and, and imagining how better to deal with it. Uh, thanks, thanks, Johnny. So there's another set of, it's another question, which is really goes back to uh, Chris's argument about the kind of Foucault set of relationships. And that is, what about those societies in which the relationship between the police and politicians is in some way less direct? So um, the Pelian kind of principles where um, the kind of the public, uh, you know, the police are the public, the, the public are the police, but there's less direct executive connections between the police and um, uh, and, the, uh, and the executive than there are in societies like South Africa or other places or France for that matter. Um, do we need to think about how these institutionally, even constitutionally differently structured um, police services uh, may impact on thinking about reform? So that's the one question. And then um, the other one is um, the, a, a comment and, and question from somebody saying that um, your your uh, notion of dissonance, uh, Johnny, is very meaningful, um, and um, whether you think because of the unsolvable di dissonance, slow incremental reform might be the highest form of ambition, that um, the most logical conclusion is that trying to reimagine the police fundamentally will backfire, and maybe that also links into the sort of institutional culture points, but if you start either slowly and persistently chipping away at laws and institutional processes, um, that might be futile. But if there were, whether there are any particular kind of small incremental changes that might actually be more long-term institutionally significant than these kind of grand reimaginings that we saw in South Africa, as you say, uh, and it was so quickly reversed. Um, Chris, should we start with you and then go on to Johnny? Sure, and I think it's a really interesting observation. I, I sort of was struck by it earlier. I also, I 
I don't experience, I have my experience working with the home office, with the police since the 1980s to the present is not that there's a radically different relationship between politicians and police executives in the UK than there is in New York City or Los Angeles or, um, or South Africa. I think the, um, my experience has been in the same way that po urban police chiefs in the US talk about my mayor and feel very politically accountable to their particular mayor. The commissioners of the Met Police talk about my minister um, in the same way. And the efforts to transfer some of that political control to the mayor of London, I think are um, halting and, <laughs> and, and uh, slight. Um, you know, the mayor of London, you know, on a good day wants to be seen as a player in the selection of a police commissioner or the creation of policing policy. Um, but uh, there are lots of downsides of being seen in that way. And, and you only have to watch the, the news reports about um, the reappointment of Cressida Dick or her original appointment to notice how um, tangential the, the mayor actually is. But the, the reforms in the UK about moving um, local policing outside of London under under police commissioners who were elected, um, does not is not a language of distancing policing from elected officials. Just the opposite. It's uh, it's bringing a policing under elected democratic control. Um, so I I I'm interested in that question. The questioner clearly thinks there's a bigger difference than I see in political control, and they may be absolutely right. My my experience has not been. So much, and what I um, and I do, um, I, I guess it's implicit in what I've been saying. In, in a let's just be clear, in a in a in an autocratic system, in a dictatorship, in a in an autocracy, policing looks in some ways it looks the same. That is, you can take a picture of the Oakland police confronting the Black Lives Matter protesters a couple of years ago, um, violently throwing tear gas, all dressed up in hard armor. And if you didn't identify it as Oakland, you wouldn't know whether that was happening in an authoritarian state or a dem democratic state. There's nothing about a picture of policing in that moment that distinguishes democratic policing from authoritarian policing. It's, it's the accountability that those police operate under that makes the difference. And that's what I was trying to follow. If, it's, if, all you're, if you're only accountable up to the executive, then policing may still be, be violent and problematic, but at least as a, as a leader in police or a reformer, you know exactly where you're accountable. The hard thing about running a police organization in a democracy is you're so multiply accountable in all these different directions and your own people don't respect those to whom you're accountable. And so you're managing them, you're managing morale, and you're managing all these different authorities. That's what that's what makes it hard. And I'm not sure that picture is very different in the UK or Australia than it is in New York City or Johannesburg or, um, or Paris. I, I mean, two, two quick points and, and one on that high policing information gathering function and, and specifically in South Africa. I, you know, in the last decade or so, you know, the practice has drifted so very far from, from, from the formal ostensible oversight mechanisms that one can only be quite pessimistic, you know, from parliamentary oversight to the independent police watchdog, you know, their oversight is breached as a matter of course. Um, and, and one wonders what to do in a situation like that and whether one can actually write a reform. Um, you know, the ruling party's politics is now so deeply factionalized that it is not possible to be a high level investigator or intelligence officer in the police without having a partisan loyalty. Um, it is so, the fact that you're selling your information or bargaining your information with a factional interest is, is, is baked in. Um, um, and, and for that to change, much bigger things than policing or the oversight of policing has to change. Um, uh, and so, in a sense, trying to reform policing there is barking up the wrong tree. It's, it's, it's become much bigger than that, um, which is a very shrug the shoulders pessimistic thing to say. But I'm, 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 at, at this point, I'm, I'm not sure that that's wrong. I mean, on the point of, 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 of the dissonance and whether what one does is, is chip away, um, I mean, oddly, I think that there is more hope in, in that regard in, in relationship between the police's relationship 
with with communities rather than with politicians and, and that is really you know police are going to respond to situations armed and with violence and and again and again use unlawful violence and and, and i think I think that there is a space there for civil society to make quite a powerful impact, which is, which is to try and ensure each time when you know the marginal and the forgotten are, are the people who are the fatalities, the people who are injured, uh, the people who grave injustice is committed against, is to is to organise against that and to shout, um, and that's absolutely possible at a local level. You know, local communities in South Africa are famously volatile and 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 march and and chant and make a noise. Um, and local level organization can make it systemically very difficult for police to abuse people. Um, you, you actually can, can change a culture through collective public action. Um, it, it takes enormous dedication. It doesn't take, you know, those pie in the sky champions, geniuses who you only find in one place. It can happen everywhere. Um, it takes dedication and commitment. So I'm much more hopeful about changing the relationship between police and, and ordinary people. Uh, oh, sorry about that. Than, uh, than, 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 than high police. Great. Thanks very much both. And so we, we have a couple of comments in the chat, which I'm just going to quickly pick up. So one is that um, uh, Thomas Probert's point, which is that very often what is rightly condemned as police abuse are in fact lawful actions under domestic law. And um, he points to a recent comparative survey on domestic laws showing that dem democratic societies don't necessarily have better laws on uh, to control police abuse. And of course, one of the reasons for that is that police, them police themselves are pretty persuasive as lobbyists in the debates about legal reform. So again, just an, an interesting comment which people might want to comment on. Um, so, uh, and another of the uh, participants wants to know, Johnny, whether you can provide the name of the, of the researcher who worked on surveying working class civilian support for police after high density operations, uh, because the name wasn't called. So if you could provide that, that would be good. I mean, just one last thought to the two of you is that we haven't talked much about police corruption, which, uh, you know, it fits in again with, um, you know, uh, Chris's very kind of, uh, I think, helpful structure between uh, police, the executive, the community, uh, courts and of course the corporate structure but it's another factor isn't it that is a major driver of ref resistance to reform and it also leads to this kind of fragmentation in the organization high levels of distrust and so on and whether you know whether when you're trying to think about this big picture uh, there is anything really practical one can do about this because actually uh, stopping police corruption once it's deeply rooted is really very difficult as um, as we've seen in all sorts of many different places. Just wonder whether you might, I know Chris this is something you think about a lot so you might want to have a few words on that uh, uh, before we finish. Well I think it's, I mean I, I just uh, agree with that point and I think there you know corruption and corruption in policing um, is is it's everywhere for, I think, the, I think in some ways the reasons I was suggesting. If you think the model of policing is everybody should have an abstract vision about lawfulness and it's just a question of delivering that, it's one thing. But if what's going on is this constant trading um, of peace or public order and information and, and customer service for different customers, um, I think you can see why it begins to slip into self-interest. I think the most interesting thing that, that I've seen recently is um, Nola Alone and her panel's report on the Daniel Morgan case in the UK, in which she's basically arguing that police corruption includes the valuing of the department, of the organization, over the public interest. And on that, on that definition of corruption, you, it, it's, it almost, it looks like, like what a lot of, like what a lot of police are sort of after, this sort of, it, and this, this this worry that that the um, that the public interest has been lost in policing. I think she's on to something there, but defining that as simply police corruption is is probably uh, is is probably misdiagnosing the problem. I, I so I so I do think there is something inherent in police in the in this trade in this the fact that it's a series of constant trades makes corruption always just one step away. And why the 
again, why the why the most successful efforts around corruption are about culture change and structure and not rules and procedures, because those are just evaded time and time again, because you, you can't you can't you can't get away from the trade. Great. Uh, Johnny, anything you'd like to say about that? Just briefly, uh, I mean, firstly, the researcher was Ted Leggett, and I can probably dig up his old 20 year old work out there. I think it's it's still around somewhere. Um, I mean, a very quick point on corruption, and again, it's very parochially about one country. Um, but I think there again, the, the connection between policing and, and much broader waves and, and syndromes in society is very important. And, and that's a syndrome of what it means to be upwardly mobile um, and the sort of debt what gets into getting upwardly mobile. You know, changing one's class position is still what democracy is about in South Africa. That is what people are striving to do. And baked into getting into the police, getting recruited and getting in is to buy a house, preferably out of the township and in the suburbs and put your kids in good schools and get a car. Um, and you're immediately in a debt spiral that's very hard to control. And, and that is understood by ordinary people. It is understood that, that police are going to charge private, uh, privately for whatever service they provide because they have to, <laughs> because, because everybody is in debt if they're trying to get ahead and the police are no different. And it's quite strange because it's, it introduces yet another dissonance, which is that, which is that people, you know, the police are absolute dirt as results. They're, they're just there to feed their own life projects. And, you know, that is understood that they're in a public service doing something very selfish. And yet everybody relates to that project too. <laughs> and it does make the police like everybody else. So there's a, it, it results in this very strange intimate ambivalence where everybody knows what's going on and both hate it and yet completely understand it. Yeah. Well, that seems a good uh, uh, moment to end. Thanks to you both for a really, um, really fascinating conversation on, I think, you know, one of, one of the most difficult issues for modern democracies and one which we perhaps have to live in a state of unquiet about as, um, as uh, Johnny has suggested that in fact, these are things that we can, that, that are going to be with us for a long time. Thanks to all of you who've uh, participated and attended for your great questions and your interest in, uh, in this. And just to say that this is the last in this uh, series this term, we'll have four next term, all within this kind of new framework of asking a contemporary, question of contemporary importance that's quite provocative around some aspect of human rights. And uh, we, we hope you'll keep an eye on that, uh, on, on, on the events that will be coming next term. In the meantime, uh, wishing all of those of you who particularly students are kind of somewhat of a rest over the break and to everybody else, keep well and, and keep safe in these difficult times. To any South Africans, wishing you lots of solidarity from the cold, uh, cold part of Oxford and, um, and hope to see you soon. And thanks again to Chris and Johnny for a great conversation. Bye now. Bye. Thanks. Hey, thanks, Johnny. Thanks all.